Good morning. 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 Blessing the Lord be upon you. Bless you in the name of the Lord. Thank you. <coughs> Again, in your testament period of history, we are on lesson number 14. <coughs> in perspective, here's what we've been through, and down here, section B, the division of the empire, the Greek empire, Alexander the Great we studied again, last week we looked at uh, Judah, or Judea, under the reign of the Ptolemies in Egypt. And what we're going to do today is look at the Seleucids' control of Judea. But what we did, we went on down through, clear through uh, Cleopatra, who was the last Egyptian queen, just to finish off the Egyptian part of this, the Ptolemies of the uh, uh, divided kingdom. Uh, or empire that Alexander had left. <coughs> Excuse me. So today, we're going to start with Seleucid control, or Judea under Seleucid control. There's a lot of information here. I want to get through as much as we can. Uh, probably try to get 40 minutes in on this. Uh, depending on where it ends up, but you may not get that much in on it. Because what we want to do is when we get to the next section with, uh, with Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, we're going to have a whole section on him because that's when we really get to dealing with problems that begin in Judea and uh, the beginning of the Maccabean period. Uh, and that's really going to be of some interest to us, I believe. So Judea under Seleucid control is from 198 BC to 63. And we talked about the Greek Civil War last week, right? We talked about the Greek Civil War, how that it began about uh, 216 and lasted down to about uh, 198 in that area when uh, Antiochus III is defeated by Ptolemy V. And Daniel chapter 11, verses 14 through 19, some good information that uh, this is where scholars would put uh, the uh, the prophecy about this time period, what Dan, where Daniel was speaking about it. Um, Antiochus III is called the Great of the Seleucid Kingdom. He defeats Ptolemy V, and his moniker was Epiphanes. Uh, Palestine, including Jerusalem, then comes under Seleucid control. Before that, they were under the control of the Egyptians. The daughter of women to destroy the kingdom that's mentioned there in Daniel's prophecy was Antiochus' daughter, who was then given in marriage to Ptolemy. So Antiochus defeats Ptolemy, lets his daughter marry Ptolemy, it's kind of, we make a peace treaty here. Judea is kind of under the control of both of them to a degree, but the Eastern Seleucids are totally in control. Then Antiochus III decides that he's going to invade Greece. And when he invades Greece, in 190 BC, he is defeated by Rome at Magnesia. 
Now, of course, magnesia is famous for Phillips magnesia. <laughs> Milk of magnesia, right? That's where the stuff comes from, or did come from. That's where people discovered, hey, this is good for your stomach, and <laughs> what ails you? Uh, but that, that is a town, city, in uh, the area of Asia Minor. But in this battle, uh, Antiochus III is defeated by Rome. Now, you understand, he's, he's attacking Greece. And if you remember the map, it's Greece and Thrace. And he's attacking them, but Rome is now in league with the Greeks. And Rome is starting to grow. Rome is starting to get powerful. So here the Romans come in and the Romans defeat him. And all of Asia Minor is ceded to the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic. And we understand the difference. The Roman Empire doesn't begin to about, until about 63 BC. You have a Roman Republic that's ruled by the Senate. The Senate. Would that be all the way to the river, to the east, the territory, the Asia Minor that the, Roman, the Romans took then? You know, we looked at last week the large no. Or it went all the way over to, no. I don't remember the name of the river, Indian area. Right. Okay. Seleucid's kingdom. Yeah. Did you talk about that? this area? Okay. So Rome is over here, and Rome is already making. Uh, inroads into this area. Here's Magnesia. This Antiochus the third, right? Is that the correct one? So he's attacking up here. He gets defeated. But all of this area then that he has, and remember this area was Pergamon. This is an independent area here. But all of this then is ceded. He gives it up to the Roman Republic. The, the difference with the Roman Republic, the Senate ruled in Rome. What kept them a republic was they had armies that went out throughout all the world, so to speak. The armies were not allowed to come into Rome because they understood if, a Ro if an army came into Rome, the general of that army could take control. And they were able to keep the armies out until Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. If, if you heard that phrase, crossing the Rubicon? Didn't know what it meant. That Rubicon is a river, and they were supposed to stay on the other side of the Rubicon. But when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, he came in, he took over the Senate, and he began to rule. Now, he's called a Caesar, but he's not a, a Caesar in the sense of being a dictator. And that's now in the, yeah, that's pre, uh, 63 B.C. Now, uh, I'm throwing that date out there. Uh, it's not until Augustus Caesar, Octavian, who becomes Augustus Caesar, takes complete control. And that's the Roman Empire in 63. So, still under the Senate. But you can see how much territory is lost here to Magnesia. And, and that thought just the thought of that is going to come into play later in these historical events. So, you see what's happening. All right, now back to not this one, but the next one. There we go. 
also the Seleucid Empire ceded all of Asia Minor to Roman Republic over the next 101 years from 190 to what would that be? That would be 80, 89. The Seleucid Kingdom crumbled as well. They just keep losing, 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 losing. And eventually, it's not going to be called the Seleucid Empire, it's going to be called Syria. So when I get to chain you down here to a certain point, and I start talking about Syria, you'll know that that's what, what's going on. Then, 187 BC to 175 BC, Seleucus, Seleucus, or Seleucus IV, was the seventh king of the Seleucid dynasty. He imposed heavy taxes, especially on Judea. Why would he impose heavy taxes on Judea? Well, that's where the trade routes run through, and you know, they're pretty rich, and they've been allowed to do what they want to do for a long time, so hey, that's where the money was. His son and heir, Demetrius, had been sent to Rome as a hostage for reparation monies. In other words, Rome, because of this war that, that was lost uh, by the previous guy, Antiochus III, uh, they had to pay reparations. So Rome takes his son, uh, Seleucus IV's son, Demetrius, to Rome as a hostage you keep paying us or we'll kill your son. Seleucus was then assassinated by Heliodorus and his brother Antiochus IV seized the throne. So that gets you down to 175 BC. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, 175 to 164 BC. That's only 11 years. The 11 years of his reign were the most, probably the most terrifying, most difficult for the people of Judea, for the Jews. He suffered more defeats and persecuted Judea because of it. Every time he got beat somewhere, he took it out on the Jews. In 83, we're, we're, we're dropping on down through the time period here to get to the end of the Seleucid Empire. So in between here, they're, they're, it, it's crumbling, it's becoming Syria. You've got a lot of leaders that they don't do a whole lot. In 83 BC, Tigranus II destroyed the Seleucid Empire. So it's basically gone. And in 63 BC, which is 20 years later, Pompey defeated Antiochus the 13th. So you're going from Antiochus 4 to Antiochus 13. What is that? There's about eight in between there that just they're not able to do very much. You're just losing, 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 losing. And Pompey, who was a Pompey with the Romans. And that's at what? The beginning of the Roman, pretty much the Roman Republic, or Roman Empire. So we get that out of the way. We come back to Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes. This man is terrible. Terrible. 175 BC to 164. And there's so much material involved with Judea that this ruler deserves this complete section of study. Up to this point in the intertestamental period, Judea was in the periphery and left alone. Yeah, they, they were in the middle of conflict, but they were kind of, you know, you can have your own governor or political leaders, you know. You're under us, but and you may have to pay some taxes here, taxes there, you know, whatever. Do what you need to do to get along, but, but you can have your religion and 
you can do this and you can do that. But when this guy comes along, everything changes. He embraced imperial colonialism. Remember in your history lessons what happened when the British Empire went to places like Africa, India, China. What was their, they, they, they wanted to trade, but what did they try to do? Took them over. They tried to make them Englishmen. That's why Africa is most of the nations are English speaking. Yes. But but the French did the same thing, the Spanish did the same thing. All those European nations, Germans did the same thing. All of them did the did the same thing. They tried to make them uh, turn their civilization into it, you're going to be like us. That's what the Americans did with the Indians tried to Americanize them and make them give up their religious beliefs and dress and eat and talk and things like that. Right. That's terrible. Right. Great Britain was the only one that was successful, grossly successful at occupying and uh, holding. Yes. And what was the reason for Over that? Time. Yeah, what was the reason for that? They had the most powerful navy and military in the world, and they imposed their will on others. And there were some you know, that accepted it, and, you know, just briefly in that history. But uh, who were the, the first to reject that? United States. We're, we're, we're not going to be a colony. We're not, we're not like those people in Africa and Asia, subcontinent India. We're Englishmen. We remember the Magna Carta. And we're not going to be colonials. Right? Wouldn't that be what they were called? In fact, some of the sports teams uh, in just our recent past were called the Colonials, right? Or something of that nature. So, yeah, but we're not. We're, we're equals. Well, once people saw what the United States did, America did, what happened? The British Empire crumbled over a period of time. So, in essence, that's what's happening with uh, Persia, the Seleucid Empire. You, you see that crumbling that happens. But this guy wants to bring it back, especially right there in Judea. He, he, it, it's one place where he can uh, perpetrate this terrible I don't want to put it. The Romans have taken over Greece and Asia Minor. Remember what happened in Persia? Alexander the Great comes in and he wants to make Persia like Greece, but then he flips the script and he wants to make Greece like Persia and he wants to create a race of Persians and Greeks that will serve him. And that's like the Indo-European peoples. Well, Antiochus is kind of following in those footsteps. I'm going to restore the Greek Empire, or at least Greek civilization. Somewhere, well, where's he going to, where could he start? What, what would be the weakest part? It's not going to be Asia Minor. It's going to be Judea. It's going to be you having a, a seaport on the Mediterranean and able to then have trade and then have 
a navy. He's stuck. He's got to have that. So, uh, they had been left alone, but at this point, the Jewish people did not fit in Antiochus Thor's vision for his new empire, what it was going to be. So embracing this imperial colonialism, Antiochus sought a sense of cultural uniformity. What does uniformity and if you have cultural uniformity you can't have people that disagree with you is that what's going on right now if you don't agree with the left you're going to be ridiculed you're going to be losing jobs you're going to be sued, you're going to be thrown in jail, all those things is happening here in America today. So Hellenism was presented as a way of life. You got to be a Greek. You can't be a Jew anymore. You can't be Judean. You've got to be a Greek. You've got to follow Greek. You got to speak Greek. The worship of the Greek pantheon, especially Zeus. Zeus was the highest, right? He's the highest in the pantheon. Then you got Hercules and all. You know, I, I don't know what all there is. Athena is going to be in there somewhere. You got all Bacchus. The monotheistic Jews resorted to a cultural civil war because of this. They didn't want that. Antiochus claimed to be Zeus incarnate. And that's what Epiphanes, Epiphanes means God manifest. And I think I told you that before. So when he sang, I'm Antiochus for Epiphanes, I am God manifest. I'm God who's showing up you better do what I say. So what happens in Judea? You've got some people there who welcome and embrace these policies. Just like in some of the other pagan nations from before. And listen, when Rome begins to take over, what, what's their attitude toward religion? You can have any religion you want, but you honor all the gods. All of them. And you know what? If we make Caesar a god, you, you honor him too. You, little pin, you put a little pinch of incense on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord. Ecumenism at possibly the highest level. So the monotheistic populace of the Jews resorted to a cultural civil war. The high priestly families fought against the Hellenistic Jews put in power by Antiochus for Epiphany. So here he comes. He comes in, he, he takes over Judea, and you got these Jews that say, we're not going to do it. We're going to follow the law of Moses, and we're going to live what, like we've lived for whew, nearly a thousand years or more. Well, yeah, more than a thousand years. We'll change that. Remember, they didn't have kings. They didn't have their own governors so much. They were put by uh, political appointees. There may be a Jew there, but he's a political appointee. Who did they look to? They looked to the high priest for leadership. And we talked about... One man, let me go back here. The 
Simon the Just, who was high priest, was, you know, they really, the Jewish people really looked to him as being a leader and a ruler. Some of his descendants were pretty good. We'll get into that here shortly. What happens is, Antiochus comes in and he says, you know what, this office of high priest, that's a political office. Your high priest is gone, I'm appointing the high priest. Who's he going to appoint? Someone who is strong of law posts, strong in Jewish culture, strong to the Lord, or is he going to appoint someone who, hey, let's be progressive. <laughs> Same thing that was happening at the time of Jesus. Remember Jesus, you had two high priests. Annas was high priest. And the Romans didn't like it because you know, things weren't quite going their way, so they deposed Annas and they made Caiaphas, his son-in-law, high priest. Because Caiaphas would be more suitable to their ends. When they made that office a political office, it changed things in Judea. Right? Current example, what's happened with this last pope that the Catholic Church has installed? He's a political leader, isn't he? Look at how he's changed things in the Catholic Church, allowing gays and talking old stuff there. All right? See, history repeats itself over and over. So, uh, the high priestly families, like Simon's family, who's fighting this to punish the Jews, Antiochus then plunders the Jerusalem temple. <coughs> he carried off the sacred vessels, and then he used money uh, taken from that, you know, melt down the gold, you know, get rid of the gold, pay off your, you know, here's, here's money, I can go fight some military campaigns with this, with this stuff. Punishment punishment. You don't do what we say, we punish you. You're not allowed to live like you want to live. You're not allowed to live like your God tells you to live. You have to live like we say. So Antiochus then, uh, well, Antiochus Epiphany, 4 Epiphanies, appears to be the little horn of Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. We talked about the little horn, remember? Uh, the Greek Empire, uh, the, the goat with the two horns that comes and defeats the ram, and then the horns are broken off, and there are, what, four, and then there's one little one that comes up, and he's the troublemaker. So if you want to later, remember that. Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. And he's the, he is the prototype of the Antichrist that many scholars will point to when talking about, here's a big word, eschatology. Eschatology means the study of in things. And the book of uh, Revelation talks about the Antichrist. You know, the Antichrist is talked about in uh, other books in the New Testament. But what's going to happen at the end? Well, Antichrist is going to come. We're told many antichrists have come. Well, he is the antitype of that. In other words, this is what he's going to look like. You know, a political figure comes, takes over, does this, does that, whatever have you. Uh, not 
necessarily necessarily physical, but there you have it. You can read into it what you want. Do some study on it. Antiochus then heads east, attempting to defeat the Parthians. Remember the Parthians? We talked about them a little bit. They, they were still like the per, uh, Pergamon. They were independent. They, they hadn't been taken yet, and I told you before, they're going to be a thorn in the side of the Romans. <laughs> Romans can't get past them to get over into India. But he goes up there to defeat the Parthians. He left Palestine and Judea under the, the, the authority of generals. Antiochus suffered a military defeat, contracted an illness, and died. Some will say that in that illness he became distempered, mad. But he dies there. But when he dies, the Jews revolted under the leadership of the Maccabees. They eventually won their political and religious freedom. And each year during Hanukkah, the memory of this great event is celebrated by the Jewish people. Talk more about that. Okay. Going back, focusing a little deeper now. We've taken a couple layers off the onion. Now we're going to go a little deeper into the onion. Okay? Antiochus IV and Jason, high priest. Remember Simon the Just? We talked about. Now we're going to get with Jason. So Antiochus Epiphany, oh, I'm sorry, Antiochus Epimenes. The madman. Epimenes. Menes. Or Menes. It's maniac. Mania. From the Greek. Epi. Over maniac. Over. The Jews called him the madman for some of the things that he did. <clears throat> so we go, we step back little bit in time and Jerusalem was ruled by the high priest Onius the third a descendant of Simon the Just. Onius was a faithful Jew but his brother Jesus was a brainwashed Hellenistic collaborator. Huh? It's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. No, it's not Jesus, it's Jesus. In Hebrew, Jesus. In Greek, in Greek, it'd be Jesus also. In English, I, I think I've explained that. Okay. Jesus, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. But he is a brainwashed. Hellenist. In other words, he wanted to change. He, want, he wanted to progress it. He, he wanted to deal with Antiochus. And Antiochus the fourth, the fourth saw the office as a political decision. So what do you do with a political decision? You auction it off to the highest bidder. Jesus won the position and made high priest, was made high priest. And that's in 2 Maccabees chapter 4, verses 7 through 26. Maccabees is not in our Bible. It's in some Bibles. It's in the Catholic Bible. They accept it. We don't see it as being scripture. But, and there are reasons for it. You can study that. I think we talked about it before. But, all right. You come to the time of the New Testament. When Mary has a child, Joseph is her husband. What should her child's name be? Should be Joseph. You shall call his name what? Jesus. I didn't know there was any other people named Jesus. It was a very popular name. Yeah. Well, what would the Pharisees 
thinking that. They knew their history. If I had a child named Benedict Arnold Riley, catch the point? So he becomes the high priest. <clears throat> He's determined to transform Jerusalem into a Greek city. He changed his name from Jesus to Jason, from Hebrew to Greek, see? He built a gymnasium where Jewish youth could exercise in the nude because that's what the Greeks did. That's what a gym, gymnos in the Greek means naked or strict. Why do you think that sports activities wear such <laughs> costumes as they do? Cheerleaders? wear such costumes as they do? Where does that come from? Right there. Right there. The people of Jerusalem were instructed to call themselves Antiochites. And remember, Antioch was a city, and Antioch's a, a, a city that comes up frequently in the New Testament, right? But who was that named after? These rulers of Syria. We'll, cut, we'll start calling it Syria. Antioch. You're Antiochites. You belong to the Seleucids. You belong to us who are reimposing Greek culture on the world. If we can possibly do it, we can take it over. Greek fashions. <laughs> Foreign customs and licentious behaviors became the norm. Many of the priests forsook temple activities to attend sporting events. Let's go to the discus throws. See how far they can throw the javelin. I can't go to church this morning because of the football game. The Cowboys are going to be on TV. Tell me what's new. Tell me what's new. There's nothing. When the communists took over Cuba, what did they do? They gave everybody a television set, and what they put on TV? Baseball. Baseball. You watch baseball. And propaganda. Baseball. Sporting events. That's how you take over a culture. People, people care more about sporting events. The Jews were trying to appear as Gentiles. Now, the Jews' reaction to Antiochus IV. <coughs> and we're just about done here. Uh, while the Hellenist Jews saw these changes as the cultured and progressive, we're, we're the intelligent ones. We're the ones that went over here and we got educated in, in these schools and stuff, and we've read the, the uh, uh, philosophers of the Greeks and, and we're smart and this is what will make our country great and you've got to accept these new people walking around and you know some of the things that they were doing in the in the temple that you had soldiers that actually this is coming into the temple and the Greek soldiers coming in and they were performing sexual acts for the gods of the Greeks. The 
conservative Jew saw them as worldly and worthless. The supporters of the old order were called Hasidim or Hasidim, the pious ones. And the difference is that whether in the Hebrew you use the first letter Het or Pit, which the difference is about like that, closing up the end inside of one letter. So you can see why it was so easy. I can show you on a piece of paper. Uh, so, sh 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 little opening here, that's a pit. Close that opening, makes it a pit. Like a German, like a Bach. So if you can see if somebody had bad eyesight, well that's a that's a that's a hit, not a hay. The Hasidim were the forerunners of the Pharisees. Preparing to restore the old paths. Old paths. That is something that has been picked up by some of the, by the conservative element of the Church of Christ. Searching for the old paths. When you hear somebody say, back to the Bible, speak where the Bible speaks, sign where the Bible is silent, that's what you're talking about. Out back to the old paths, you'll see uh, literature, old paths, uh, uh, lectureships, old path lectureships and stuff. What are, they, what are they wanting? What are they desiring? Go back and serve God the way that the, the New Testament says. Right? Uh, so, they were preparing to restore the old paths there. The Hellenists were liberals and forerunners of the Sadducees. The Sadducees came. They came to the point. There's no such thing as angels, no such thing as spirits. There's not going to be, there's no resurrection. It's just, it's all fables. It doesn't matter what we do. It's just tradition. And we're getting like that in many of our, what we would call the left leaning part of the church. And the entertainment phases of it and such, <coughs> departing from the old paths. So, we're going to stop there. Because we've got to start on it. Now, we'll come up with Menelaus next week. And, and he's another high priest. <laughs> it's good. It's good. He, he turns the script on his brother. So I'm going to put down here. We got an eight, uh, slide 85. And we'll start with 86 next week. And, and we'll finish that up. Uh, the, uh, and, and get then maybe even start into some of the McAfee period material. But anyway, thank you so much for your time and attention.